Oh, good evening, everybody. Um, and welcome especially to Keith Robinson. One or two uh, brief reflections around Keith's uh, uh, life and work. Um, spent his childhood in the black country. Good man. Uh, and some of his indirect ancestors were colliery owners. So I guess if they're looking down on this talk tonight, they may be turning in there uh, wherever. Um, <laughs> Keith has worked as a teacher, spent four years as a volunteer doing village development in India and worked for 25 years for the National Trust, finishing as a consultancy manager for sites across the West Midlands. Currently, he is our society vice chair. He runs the society's book sales and organise its talks programme. Since his retirement, he's written a number of books on the black country. Don't know where this guy finds the time to do all this. Um, Iron, Coal and Roses, Eldon Street, the history of Darleston told through the lives of people of one street, the Wensbury Workhouse and the Parish Poor, as well as a book on tonight's topic. His latest book on Wensbury's history, Tube Town Tales, will be published in March next year. Now, before I hand over to Keith, um, three practical things, please. First of all, um, can you make sure that your microphones um, are muted um, so that we don't have somebody trying to take over the talk from Keith? Um, if you've got questions uh, as the talk goes on, please, can you um, put them into the chat box? You'll see the little sign chat at the bottom um, of your screen. Click on that, write the question in. Uh, uh, and after um, Keith's spoken to us, um, Chris Baker will, will go through those questions um, uh, and we can hear responses to them. And the last thing is, um, for those of you who want a little bit of fellowship, after the talk and after the questions, um, we will be going into breakout rooms, small groups to share together for a few minutes to reflect on, on, the, on the talk or anything else you want to talk about, preferably about the black country rather than your bunions or whatever. Um, so there we are. Without <clears throat> further ado, I'm going to say thank you, Keith, for uh, what's coming. We know it'll be good. Uh, black country miners, a struggle for justice. OK, thank you very much uh, for that introduction, Ward. Um, I will uh, just get the share screen going. Right. Uh, can everybody uh, see that? Yes. Please. Yeah. OK. So. Um, as I say, welcome, everybody. Um, as we all know, um, the black country was the powerhouse uh, at the height of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and behind that powerhouse was the 30 foot coal seam, uh, which ran under the area. And key, coal was the key ingredient to most of the industries of the area, especially uh, iron. Um, and the black country was just littered with pits. Uh, this is uh, a map of the collieries in the back country in 1861, um, and each of those dots represents one colliery. Uh, and of course, within each of those collieries, uh, there were uh, a number of different pits and shafts. Um, about the same time, um, this uh, lists the number of collieries in each of the districts in the Black Country, uh, and they numbered 423. So you can imagine the uh, what we might term an environmental disaster area uh, at that particular time. Um, so fortunes were made by the people who owned these collieries, including my indirect ancestors who owned uh, mines in uh, Darleston and, uh, uh, and Bilston. But those fortunes were made on the backs of uh, thousands of miners and the deaths of thousands of miners uh, within the black country. So how did I get into this? You know, besides the fact that my ancestors, indirect ancestors were, uh, ancestors were colliery owners. It really started uh, with my discovery 
on eBay for the price of about three pounds. Uh, it was a a, po uh, a miner's pocket booklet. It was designed to go in the pocket for the West Bromwich Amalgamated Association of Miners, uh, which met in the Ball Inn uh, in Great Bridge. And it's quite a rare find because not only does it list all the uh, office holders, but it lists all the lodge representatives. So you can see those people, those uh, miners were coming from Great Bridge, Greet Green, Dudley Port, Hilltop, uh, Toll End, um, Rounds Green, Albury, Langley, Princess End, Coesley, um, White Heath, Cates Hill, Summer Hill, Braids Village, as well, of course, as West Bromwich. Um, itself. So my challenge was, can I tell the story of the Black Country miners' struggle for justice uh, during the 19th, uh, late 19th or middle of the second half of the 19th and early 20th century through the experiences of these people uh, within the booklet? Um, so what were the aims of this association? Um, there were several, which I've sort of um, hived down, uh, to procure legislative enactments for the more efficient management of mines, to protect members when unjustly dealt with by employers, to procure compensation for accidents, to regulate the hours of labour, to provide yeah, a weekly yeah. allowance and support of members who may be on strike and to provide a weekly allowance to widows and children of deceased uh, members. And the members of the West Bromwich Association uh, ha would have worn their cap badge and probably wore it with a lot of pride. And this is the cap badge that's from my uh, personal uh, collection. Um, but it, this is not just about the past. It's got a lot of resonance with what's going on in society today. Um, it's about health and safety and the deregulation that's being attempted uh, at the minute in many areas. It's about people trying to feed their families. It's about the 1% uh, super rich in society and the inequality uh, that exists. It's about the right to strike, uh, which, of course, has been in the news quite a lot, about getting benefits when you're sick. But it's also about how do you actually make effective changes to injustices uh, in society? So what I'm going to cover in the next 40 minutes or so, 35, 40 minutes of conditions and accidents in the mines, compensation systems, butties in the truck system, uh, the strikes that occurred, emigration, uh, and the uh, uh, decline of the con uh, black country mining. And it interspersed with that will be a few uh, uh, very small case studies. So if you look at the figures on the death rate in mines, in the second half of the 19th century, you can see that Belgium had 2.8 deaths per thousand miners. England generally had 4.5. Staffordshire had 7.3. Um, and uh, that was largely uh, upped uh, and would have been higher within the black country. Um, and it wasn't just about deaths. It was the injuries uh, that were suffered. Um, in one of the mines inspectors reports for 1865, there were something like 13,200 serious injuries um, in the mines in the West Midlands in that one single year. And by my estimation of the ones that I found, there are at least a thousand deaths in the West Bromwich Association's area, the ones that they covered. And I know I've missed plenty more. Um, so why was it? Why was there such a 
high death rate uh, in black country mines? Well, largely um, it was to do with the the way that the coal was mined. Um, it, they used the pillar and stall um, uh, method. This is quite a, um, an idealized picture um, of the pillar and stall, but you can see uh, those pillars there are, uh, are supposedly uh, actually coal. Um, they didn't tend to use as many pit props uh, as necessary. Uh, and that was the main reason why the death rate was so high uh, in mines in the black in the black country. Uh, two of the miners uh, who featured uh, in the uh, miners booklet uh, that I showed you earlier, um, a chap called Thomas Griffiths reported that he'd been injured four times and was off work for four months. Uh, another man, Alfred Randall, uh, reported later that he had his leg broken uh, three times uh, in uh, that period. So what were the causes of these accidents? Well, the main one um, was falls of coal and then floods, explosions, falls down the shaft and fires. Um, the... The, the one that caused most deaths um, was falls of coal. Um, now, black country pits weren't like, apart from two or three of the bigger ones, weren't like the collieries in Derbyshire or uh, Yorkshire, uh, for example, which uh, employed hundreds of men. Uh, the thousand plus deaths that occurred in the West Bromwich Association's area were all in ones and twos and threes, largely. Uh, it was on and on uh, and on. Um, just a couple of examples. In the Bradley Colliery in 1858, four miners were killed in a roof fall of 15 tonnes of coal. Uh, the mines inspector, a chap called Lionel Bruff, uh, said there was a shortage of roof support. Uh, the coroner recorded a verdict of accidental death. Uh, fast forward another 15 years, and in the Moorlands colliery, uh, three miners were crushed. This time, the mines inspector was a chap called Baker, uh, and he said the responsibility lay with the charter master and his deputy. Um, but there was still a recording of a verdict of accidental death. So that was the main cause of deaths. Um, one of the second highest causes of deaths in mines uh, was floods. And the Black Country mines were plagued by uh, flooding. Um, at the old Bradley Colliery in 1862 in June, uh, four men and three boys were swept away by a flood in the mine uh, while, while they were in the process of constructing a headway to drain a pool. Uh, the mine manager... John Harvey was censured and prosecuted by the mines inspector Baker, but the case against him failed. Uh, it was often difficult uh, to nail any of the um, col colliery owners um, or their uh, management uh, because those who um, uh, 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 judged uh, the incidents were often their close colleagues and friends. I suppose the most, uh, I was going to say celebrated, but probably that's not the right word, uh, but the, the most famous incident of uh, a flood in the, the black country uh, was the Nine Locks pit flood um, in uh, 1869, um, where all these miners and the three boys sitting in front were trapped uh, in that mine by a flood uh, for about a week. Um, they were very fortunate that it was an Earl of Dudley pit and he could bring in uh, very powerful pumps. And those pumps 
were pumping out something like 250,000 gallons uh, of water um, before uh, each hour. Uh, and that carried on for a week before they could um, get them out. And I suppose it's a a celebrated uh, event because you don't come across pictures of many black country miners uh, for this period because they actually uh, survived. Um, there's not time to go into uh, all these characters, uh, but the third one from the left uh, with the moustache um, uh, is a chap called George Skidmore, who was a real uh, character. Uh, he went swimming in the uh, in the flood while they waited. They only survived by actually um, getting down on their on their stomachs and breathing in a little bit of air that was coming in uh, above the flood. Uh, but it's uh, often the case um, when your number's going to be up, it's going to be up. The man on the extreme left who survived was Zachariah, uh, um, Zachariah uh, per, uh, per Pearson. Um, and uh, a couple of years later, um, he, he uh, was killed uh, by a fall of coal in the same pit. And if you go to the person who's fourth from the left, uh, Timothy Taylor, a couple of months later, he also was killed by a fall of coal uh, in that pit. Um, incidentally, one of the um, miners who featured uh, as a lodge representative uh, in the booklet that I showed you, um, Thomas Dudley, uh, also got killed in that same year by a fall of coal. The third um, most common cause of death um, in the mines in the black country was explosions. And you might ask, well, why did you have explosions? Because you'd got safety lamps that had been in operation uh, since the first quarter of the 19th century. But the fact is that many of the mines and miners didn't use lamps because candles were seen to give off a better uh, light. Gas was pretty hard to detect. Um, there was actually no law on providing ventilation uh, until 1872. Uh, when that law was passed, uh, the uh, mine owners had to put up uh, signs uh, about the possibility of gas down a particular tunnel. But of course, many of the miners couldn't read. Um, a few explosions actually occurred uh, due to calls of nature. When you needed to go to the loo, when you were down in the mine, you wanted somewhere um, quite private. And often the miners went down a particular tunnel uh, where there was gas and, a, and an explosion uh, occurred. Um, I suppose the the worst one of the worst explosions in the Black Country occurred at the Rounds Green Colliery uh, in 1846, um, when 20 men were killed by an explosion. Uh, and they left 102 children um, fatherless. Um, one of the men who was uh, involved in that explosion was a chap called John Shakespeare. He wasn't uh, actually at the centre of the ex explosion. He was a bit of a distance away. But because of the explosion, um, he actually lost a lot of his hearing. But again, when your number's going to be up, it's going to be up. And you fast forward uh, 20 years and John Shakespeare um, is working at the Alston Colliery uh, with another group of miners and he's at the coalface. And the miners shout, John, look out. John, look out. 
But of course, he couldn't hear because he'd lost a lot of his hearing and he was crushed to death by a fall of coal. Um, it was an explosion at the uh, Hange Colliery uh, that did for another of the Lodge representatives that we see in that booklet in 1879, uh, a chap called George uh, Chater, um, who lingered on after the explosion. He was badly uh, burnt. He was uh, the Tipton Lodge representative, um, uh, but he lingered on for three or four days, uh, but didn't survive. Then you had falls down the shaft. Now, uh, the initial picture um, showed miners uh, in uh, a cage in a mine in Wensbury. But actually, for m most of the 19th century, the way that um, not only coal, but miners accessed a pit uh, was in a boke, uh, which is basically a big bucket. And you can see uh, one here at um, uh, a Black Country pit, and it's got a half a dozen uh, miners um, in. Um, and uh, quite often, uh, miners um, fell out of the boke uh, when they were over the shaft. And uh, the inspector of the mines in the Black Country in the 1850s reported that that area had more accidents caused by winding than any other part of the country. Sometimes it was due to the chain snapping. Sometimes it was due to negligence um, with people chatting in the winding house and not looking at what they were doing. Um, in uh, 1853, for example, at the Denby Hall Colliery in Dudley Port, uh, William Faulkner and Thomas Cross uh, were being wound up and they got wound over the actual drum um, of the pit gear and Cross fell to his death uh, down the mine. And then there were fires. Uh, the most uh, notorious uh, was the Black Lake uh, disaster in 1871. Um, Black Lake had a pretty bad reputation. Um, it was a colliery that was situated uh, between uh, Wensbury and uh, West Bromwich. Um, and there was a night shift in November of that year when six men and a boy were killed. A fire had started in an underground hay store and they were all suffocated. Uh, there were no charges brought against anybody because the, uh, uh, they said that the men had been asleep. Well, if you were uh, working um, uh, on piecework and you were down there, I doubt very much whether you'd spend your time asleep. Um, yes, it, it was a, a colliery with a very bad reputation, uh, lots of accidents. And in 1887, um, some miners who were there discovered a skeleton uh, that they found in one of the tunnels and no, still with his boots on, uh, no one knew uh, when he'd been killed, how long he'd actually been there. So, who was to blame for all this? Was it the owners? Uh, very often, uh, the owners of the land where uh, coal uh, was to be found um, uh, uh, tenanted their, uh, their pits um, to other people. Was it the managers? Well, there wasn't... Uh, anything that stipulated what training a manager had a co uh, of a colliery uh, had to go through. Um, the butties, the foremen in charge, um, they were often uh, at uh, on a, 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 a working at speed to try and extract as much coal as possible, and would ignore rules. Sometimes. It was the fault of the miners themselves, because if they were on a peace rate, uh, they would cut corners. What about the law? Um, well, it's one thing 
to actually pass the law. And there were a number of laws to try and regulate uh, work in mines during the second half of the 19th century. Um, but it was another thing to try and enforce them. Uh, so the inspectors actually had an extremely busy uh, job, difficult job. Um, there were four inspectors appointed in 1850 and then 12 in 1855. That was for the whole country. And if you recall the number of collieries that just existed just in the in the black country, uh at that uh at that period you can see that their role was actually something that was quite reactive um they couldn't uh they, they couldn't inspect all the pits um it was a reactive process um and the the point about the law i think is um illustrated quite clearly in the most infamous uh, colliery disaster in the black country uh, in 1908 in terms of the number of men that actually died uh, which was 28 uh, when a fire occurred at the Hampstead disaster um, the Hampstead colliery was one of the uh, biggest ones within uh, the black country it was one of the deepest pits in the area but if you look back at the history uh, of that colliery, um, it there had been 200 fires there since the colliery opened in 1873. Um, in 1898, 200 men had to be laid off uh, due to a fire. And why so many were many were, men were killed in 1908 uh, was because one of the shafts. Uh, was being repaired and a fire broke out near the other shaft. Technically, by the law, that uh, colliery should not have been open because the law uh, had been passed to state that two shafts were needed at any one time uh, to, to operating in the colliery. Uh, again, one thing to try to pass a law another thing to try and uh, enforce it. Um, one of the um, families involved uh, in the Hampstead Colliery uh, were the, uh, the, the Hotchkins. Um, Elizabeth Hotchkins uh, had initially been married to uh, William, um, who worked at the colliery. And in 1896, his neck was broken by a fall of coal. Um, she was actually pregnant with their daughter at the time, um, and she was born with quite a number of physical impair impairments, whether that was co caused by the stress of the accident, who knows? Anyway, she married uh, a few years later uh, another miner, Thomas Jones, also employed at the Hammerstead Colliery. Um, they had four children of their own, in March 1906, he was injured by a fall of coal uh, and never worked again. And to cap it all, uh, one of her sons, uh, Joseph, was one of the 28. He was 17. Uh, he was one of the uh, 28 uh, miners that were killed in that Hampstead disaster. Uh, that's just the experience um, of one family. So there were miners tried different ways to try and uh, save for the future, save uh, some money up um, in case they were injured or there was an accident. A number of pubs uh, operated uh, sick and dividend societies. This is a uh, pub check from the from the railway in uh, in Great Bridge. And people, not just miners, but other uh, labourers as well, would contribute so much and to the fund within the pub so that they have something to fall back on. Um, 
the black country uh, benefited from the um, Hartley Disaster Fund in Northumberland. Um, that was another accident that was caused uh, from a fire uh, in the shaft. Um, but it actually, t and the, they collected so much money uh, that it was decided to spread it amongst all the different uh, mining regions across the country. But it took 14 years for the, those concerned to decide how that money should be allocated. So a lot of the uh, associations, such as the West Bromwich Association, had their own uh, rules and regulations about how much each miner was to contribute um, every uh, week. And this gives you some idea of um, the how the money was actually spent, uh, the records that exist from 1872 to 1878. Uh, sick and accident pay in those six years, we're talking just about the West Bromwich Association, over 21,000, 2,500 paid out to widows, 6,000 plus on death claims, uh, and there were, there were 21,000 spent on strike pay um, and they were granting money to other trades uh, as well. So if you w were going to work every day and you were going to risk your life, you damn well want it to be paid for the risks that you were taking and the black country mines uh were uh, the scene of a number of strikes um all through the uh, the period um the 1854 64 74 84 ones they all lasted around four months uh each but it was extremely difficult to try and coordinate the miners within the Black Country area, within the West Bromwich area and beyond, um, partly because there were different rates of pay uh, for different jobs in mines. Uh, there was resentment of any authority. It didn't have to be the mine owners. It could be uh, the president of the society. And you had local rivalries between uh, the different associations and areas of the Black Country. But above all, uh, you had uh, a very wealthy uh, opposition uh, in the face of the Earl of uh, Dudley, who uh, employed around about 20,000 miners. Uh, and what he said in the black country uh, went. So they were working against uh, very tough opposition. And here is an image of one of the Earls of uh, Dudley. Um, so I seem to have uh, right. Okay, um, the one of the the first big strike uh, was in eighteen fifty eight, um, and uh, that involved uh, several thousand miners in, in the Black Country. Um, one of the key leaders uh, in that strike uh, was uh, a chap called John Wadley, um, who was actually one of the four miners called to negotiate before the strike started with the mine owners uh, in uh, the area. Um, so well respected. Two of the other leaders of the strike uh, were a chap called John Jackson, um, uh, a, a key man. Um, and he wrote that the police were trying their best to induce the miners to violence. And you will find that repeated um, all through uh, the strikes of the uh, of the 19th century. And of course, beyond, if we uh, go back uh, to the uh, 1980s, um, Jackson was actually stopped by a policeman with a sword when he was trying to take uh, coal uh, to uh, Dudley. Um, the demonstrations in that strike uh, 
uh, were all uh, very peaceful. Um, one of them was led by John uh, Foy, who uh, was the, the vice president of the West Bromwich uh, Association. You start to think about how these men or why these men got into positions of leadership. Um, some of them uh, were Methodist uh, preachers, uh, lay preachers. In John Foy's case, um, I think he got involved uh, in campaigning uh, because if you look back at the records, you find that in 1850, his 10 year old son was killed in a mine. Uh, so that's my that that's my take on perhaps why he got involved uh, in being a leader in the West Bromwich Association. So at many of these gatherings, um, uh, the the miners and their wives and families uh, sang. There was one a three thousand strong meeting at Brockmore in eighteen fifty eight. Um, where they sang God Never Made a Slave, which is an old Chartist song dating from the 1840s. And it went, Britannia's sons, though slaves ye be, God, your creator, made you free. He life and thought and being gave, but never, never made a slave. All men are equal in his sight. The bond, the free, the black, the white. He made them all, then freedom gave. He made the man, man made the slave. So like uh, all the strikes that were come, they were, that, that came, they were pretty much unsuccessful, uh, had to go back to work. Um, I mentioned that the chap called John Wadley, another of the West Bromwich uh, leaders, he was taken to court along with other, another 10 miners in that strike, uh, under the Masters and Servants Acts, uh, which were a very uh, pernicious uh, set of acts, which said which said that uh, if a miner or any actually labourer was deemed to have um, offended his employer in some way, um, he could be taken to court, fined, and imprisoned. Um, John Wadley and uh, these other miners. Uh, were taken to court for not actually giving 14 days notice uh, for being on strike. Uh, but in the actual court proceedings, uh, Wadley, who was an extremely smart man, uh, ran rings around the prosecution and said that the firm had not given 14 days notice when the wages were cut. Uh, despite all that, those 10 men were sentenced to a month's hard labour. So... And it wasn't just the conditions in the mines that uh, the black country miners represented. Uh, represented. Um, one of the key bugbears uh, was the butty system, uh, where the men were actually employed not by the colliery owner him, it's, himself, uh, but by uh, a, a, a butty. Um, and very often, butty's own pubs, and the wages were paid in a pub. And of course, you can guess uh, what happened to uh, quite a uh, bit of their uh, of the earnings over the course of a night when they were actually paid. A number of butties and also mine owners um, owned truck shops. And these were shops where you which were owned by the mine owner or the butty. And some of the wages would have been paid in tokens. This token is from the Balls Hill Colliery, dates from uh, 1829, sorry, 1819. Uh, again, the Balls Hill Colliery, uh, uh, quite uh, on the outskirts of uh, West Bromwich. Um, and how these truck sister uh, shops worked was that you had to spend a percentage of your wages uh, in those shops. Um, and you'd find that the quality of the goods was poorer than you could get elsewhere. 
but also uh, much more uh, expensive. Uh, my indirect ancestors ran a truck shop uh, in Moxley uh, near uh, Wensbury. Of course, you'd had the Truck Act of, uh, passed in 1830, which actually forbade truck shops, but they were still going in the 1870s uh, when another truck commission uh, was called to try and stamp it out forever. Um, and this gives you an example of the prices at the time uh, in 1843 at shop in shops. So you can see cheese is 8p a pound in a in a truck or Tommy shop 5p uh, ordinarily. Bacon 8p, uh, five and a half, five pence eight in the ordinary. Salt and butter shilling as opposed to nine nine pence and tea five pence uh, an ounce as opposed to threatens uh, halfpenny. So. The next major strike uh, occurred in 1864. What you have to understand about the economy in the 19th century was it was boom and then bust. And every time uh, there was a depression uh, in, uh, in the black country, um, mine owners uh, decided to uh, slash uh, the wages uh, of the uh, 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 the Colliers. Um, but in this case, in 1863, the first really powerful uh, miners' union had been set up. There'd been a miners' union set up in 1840, but it, it didn't it it didn't last very long. So 1863 saw the the foundation of the first strong miners' union, uh, the coal, lime, and ironstone miners uh, of uh, Great Britain. Um, and again, it was a four month long uh, strike. Um, and uh, after a couple of months, um, Tom, uh, uh, Thomas Griffiths, who was the mine agent for the West Bromwich Association, um, uh, was uh, a part of a conference um, between the miners and the owners, although because he was such a powerful individual, uh, his presence was actually uh, resented by the mine owners because they knew uh, that he could get the miners going. Uh, and apparently, so the story goes, uh, Lord Lee, who had been called in to mediate uh, the strike after a couple of months, um, invited Griffiths for a private conversation and tried to bribe him with a £10 note to, to get the miners uh, back to work. The 1864 strike was probably uh, the most uh, bitter of all the strikes that occurred in the 19th century. Um, there were uh, a number of clashes um, 12 Wolverhampton miners were arrested and paraded in chains. Um, 2,000 men marched on the Earl of Dudley's pit at Fox Yards. Uh, police drew their cutlasses uh, against them. And 19 miners were accused of uh, conspiracy. Um, and uh, uh, fortunately, um, they were not executed. Um, the judge who was um, part, uh, who was overseeing the trial of these men, actually said that there were two men who should have been before the court. One of those was Thomas Griffiths, uh, and the other one was Thomas Kimberley, both of whom were post holders in the West Bromwich Association. Um, as a result uh, of the strike, um, there was a bit of a split in the miners' union. Um, there was a feeling that the union that had been set up in 1863 um, wasn't uh, doing enough actively on the ground. So the Practical Miners Association was set up uh, and several of the this was a national organisation uh, and several of the key posts in that organisation uh, were held uh, by men such as Thomas Griffiths and Thomas Kimberley. Um, 
Another issue for the miners was the existence uh, that uh, they uh, led. If you can imagine um, going to work at six o'clock in the morning, coming out the pit at six at night during the winter months, you would, except for a Sunday, you wouldn't see uh, the light of day. Um, so um, there was a campaign to try and cut the number of hours um, that um, miners could uh, actually uh, work. Um, in the early 1870s, it was cut down to uh, nine hours. Uh, but of course, again, when times got tough, uh, mine owners uh, pushed back and said uh, the miner should be working for uh, 10 hours uh, a day. And it wasn't until 1908 um, that a law was passed uh, saying that uh, the maximum time that a miner could should spend underground uh, was eight hours a day. So the next uh, big clash was in 1874. Um, by this time, the uh, Amalgamated Association of Miners uh, had been formed, uh, another mining uh, uh, organisation, um, uh, to which the West Bromwich Association uh, was affiliated. Um, there was a huge meeting convention in Newport uh, in 1873 uh, with the miners from all over the country. This is obviously, a, a, a this, this is Newport, but it's obviously a much uh, later um, photograph. By this time, the West Bromwich Association miners had 3,260 members and they uh, built a miners hall uh, in Great Bridge um uh along this street apparently um the building which doesn't exist now uh but it was next to the spa i'm told uh in in great bridge um so there was another strike um and uh this one again lasted about four uh months uh because of wages cuts and uh during it eventually Joseph Chamberlain, mayor of Birmingham, was brought in to try and sort it out. Uh, and he introduced uh, what was called the Birmingham Agreement, um, uh, uh, which was a sliding scale, which worked uh, along the lines that uh, when uh, coal prices fell, wages should be reduced accordingly. When coal prices increased, then wages should increase uh, in proportion um and that lasted for um a, a few years um but the result of that strike was that um so many uh mine so much money strike pay had been paid out uh that the amalgamated associate of miners uh like its forebear the practical association of miners uh collapsed uh and all the miners in the west bromwich area uh, were advised to uh, join uh, the main union or one of the big unions uh, that had been formed in 1863, which was led by Alexander MacDonald. Um, MacDonald was uh, the first um, MP in mining uh, in Parliament who had a coal mining uh, background. But as I've said, a lot of the miners thought that he was too close uh, and buddying up to some of the powers that be in government and not taking uh, the action uh, that he needed. So by this time, in the 1870s, early 1880s, a lot of miners just couldn't take it anymore. Um, and uh, you find there are uh, a number of, a lot of black country miners um, who uh, emigrated to pastures new. Um, and you can see why. Uh, in 1869, uh, you got paid on average 
one pound four shillings for a six day week um, in the black country. If you went to Pen Pennsylvania, you got three pounds 15. Uh, in 1879, again, with a new impetus of depression, because from about the mid 1870s onwards, there was a really big depression in the black country. Um, the uh, miners in the black country set up a ballot system uh, where for, you could buy a ticket for three pounds, the three p, uh, and there was a uh, a draw, uh, and those who won uh, were given five pounds and assisted passage to go to uh, America or Australia, and you could tell you can tell that it was getting really desperate because those two men uh, getting an Amos uh, listed at the bottom there. They were the two leading lights of the Darleston uh, Amalgamated Association of, of Miners. Um, and they decided they'd had enough and they both ended up going to uh, the United States. So the last big strike in the 19th century uh, was in 1884. Um, a wages board had been set up the year before. Uh, there was a dispute over wages sent to arbitration. Um, and one of the leading members of the West Bromwich Association at the time was a chap called Samuel Henry Whitehouse. Um, and he uh, wrote a letter to uh, a paper and it said this. The feelings of the strike committee were made plain. The miners themselves say that if they work, they starve. And if they play, i.e. go on strike, they starve. They are in a most deplorable condition, although they've only been, on, uh, been a month on strike. The men, women and children look quite hopeless and say that all hope is gone, that they have not seen a day of sunshine for many years, that they cannot keep themselves and their families on the wages they have been earning that they see their wives and children dying of starvation before their eyes. I have seen much of wretchedness and misery in many places, but I never yet saw such grinding, hopeless poverty among people who work so hard and where large profits are still made. Lord Dudley gave £100 towards building a free library, and Lady Dudley opens it this week. It would be well if at the same time she would take a look at the people. And this is Samuel Henry uh, Whitehouse. He was actually hounded out and uh, ended up going to uh, Somerset. Uh, a number of uh, black country miners were blacklisted uh, and forced to try and go elsewhere. Um, but uh, they were always tracked down. And some of them, even though they'd gone to other parts of the country, um, when were never able to work as miners again because they had been um, blacklisted. Um, so, um, let me go back a bit. Um, the collapse of the 1884 strike after 16 weeks uh, led to a crash in membership uh, of all uh, mining um, unions and for 15 years that that followed uh, there was a, a tremendous amount of infighting amongst the mining unions in the black country particularly between West Bromwich, Pelsall and Old Hill um, a, a, a lot of parochialism um, by the turn of the century uh, the leaders of the West Bromwich Association, who featured in uh, the 1879 booklet, uh, had passed on. Uh, men like Henry Rust and Henry Barnes, who when every commission that was set up, every wages board was set up uh, in the black country, they were always on it as the representatives uh, of uh, the miners. Um, you had... Uh, I suppose one uplift for miners at the beginning of the 20th century uh, was uh, during the First World War uh, when coal was at a premium 
uh, and there was a uh, put two way pull uh, on uh, the men. Uh, some they, they were wanted to serve uh, abroad, but they were also needed uh, to work uh, in the mines. Um, and that's one of the few times where miners' wages actually kept up with the uh, cost of uh, living. But when the war ended, um, wages <clears throat> slipped back. But by this time, the black country uh, uh, mining industry uh, was coming to uh, an, an end in many cases. And that was because uh, many of the mines in the area were flooded. Uh, one of my indirect ancestors owned the Broadwaters Colliery uh, near Darleston. Why was it called the Broadwaters Colliery? Because in the 18th century, that area had been a lake. But eventually, water finds its own level. And although they set up pumping stations and mine owners had to pay so much uh, to the South Staffordshire um, pumping organisation, um, to uh, per ton for the ex extraction of the coal um, when the mines were pumped out, um, it really didn't actually make much difference. And you can see the decline that occurred. Uh, in 1869, 72, there were uh, 9 million tonnes of coal uh, produced in the black country and you were 28,000 miners uh, employed by 1913 this had dropped to uh, 3 million tons and there were just 10,000 miners so obviously you had then the 1926 strike which was the final nail apart from a couple of big pits um, in the coffin for black country mines so my last Question. For these men who often gave up to and around 40 years of their lives, Henry Rust, Henry Barnes, Thomas Griffiths, Thomas Mansell, Thomas Kimberley. Um, had Thomas Griffiths actually ended up, ended his life in the workhouse. So the question is, was it all worth it? Well, from my perspective, uh, if you're going to live a life, then you've got to dedicate it to something. So I take my hat off to all these men who led the struggle for justice uh, within the black country. Heath, thank you so much for that. That was absolutely fascinating. Uh, having... Uh, had four generations of my family mining in the black country uh, my father being the first one out of the uh, the mines but in the offices um, it resonates with me uh, about the desperate lives they lived so uh, I'm sure we all appreciate uh, those insights that you shared with us um, I'm going to pass back to Chris now who's going to take us through the chat box right uh, could i encourage folk if you've got any questions to put it in chat there are some there already uh, i'll sort of go through them in order um the uh, problem is in many of the names is there abbreviations so i don't quite know who's speaking but uh, somebody with the name mike g um, asks is the height of the chamber shown in the initial drawing and photo typical of black country pits keith no, I said it was uh, pretty stylized. Uh, they would have been a lot lower than uh, what's represented in that image. You know, that miners were working in four or five feet, even less um, of, a, of a tunnel. Uh, very often you were mining on your uh, on your side or yeah. to extract the coal. OK. And then Andrew asks, if a worker cuts corners, as you say, because of an exploitative wage regime, aren't you looking the wrong way through a telescope? Likewise, the lack of inspectors is a reflection of government neglect. 
yes, exactly, which is why I said the Practical Minders Association and the Amalgamated Association was set up because they didn't think there was enough pushing at, at, at the top uh, level. Um, but yes, uh, like today, uh, we need to, uh, governments need to take drastic action on certain things, but have very often have cold feet. Um, so the mine is struck uh, trying to make their, make their point. Right. Then and another Andrew, this time Andrew Homer, um, I can identify, uh, talks about the Hampstead tragedy where he simply says that he believes one of the rescue team brought into Hampstead also died. Yeah, he. I think he's one of the 28. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Then there's a question from Mike G again, and answered by Ward, but you might care to add a little more to it. Um, did the police normally carry cutlasses at the time? I thought they just had truncheons. And Ward, uh, well, in this, in yeoman. both these instances, uh, there were cutlasses, and it's. Uh, uh, recorded and reported in the local press. It, Ward adds, adds it was the yeomanry who carried cutlasses. They were carried out if the masters felt the police couldn't cope. Yeah. Well, the police also had them. OK. Uh, question from me, actually, is I'm presumably talking about the Staffordshire Constabulary, aren't we here? Uh, when did they begin to be organised and to become an effective tool in the hand of the masters, one might say? <laughs> Uh, this was some, somewhere in the late 1840s, but initially it wasn't compulsory to um, appoint uh, uh, constables in your area. Um, and they relied, uh, quite a few places relied on volunteers for the first 10 years until you had things like uh, charter strikes and marches where a lot of uh, uh, local uh, authorities, local boards uh, quickly changed their mind about the need for um, full-time policemen. Okay. Uh, then Andrew again, who's identified himself as Andrew Gething, said, could you please tell me Gething's first name, please, as it's my surname? Um, uh, off the top of my head, no. But I, but if he e emails me, I'll find out uh, for him. I, um, I haven't got it to hand. OK, the best way to do that, Andrew, is to email the society, me, in other words, where uh, the standard email address uh, for the virtual group, and I'll pass it on to Keith. Um, a question from me, really. Uh, there are no more questions, so if people want to ask more questions, Please do put, put it into chat quite quickly now. Um, you touched on the potential religious motivation there. What Was Methodism a major force in the motivation here? Uh, in the West Bromwich Miners, there were uh, uh, association, there were several um, uh, of the, uh, of the, rep, of the post holders um, who uh, had uh, who were lay Methodist preachers, and they, of course, when if you were a preacher, then you had a training in public speaking, uh, which naturally uh, would elevate you to, uh, or you'd be encouraged to take a position of responsibility uh, in uh, an association that was uh, fighting for justice. So yes, yeah. Um... And George, the moderator, says, like Wesley Perrins. George, you want to say more? You can come online yourself now. Sorry, just the, just the, the MP um, from uh, uh, from south of the Black Country down by a sort of Stourbridge way. He was. Um, he was. Uh, he, he mentioned himself how he was sent to public speaking elocution lessons to help him get into. Uh, the business of politics. Okay, thank you. Andrew Gething again asks, do you have any information about Charles Gething in the Warsaw area? I believe uh, in the mining, Miners' Union. Uh, afraid not, not, not to hand, but I might be able to find something out. Okay, again, pass it on to me. Okay, I think we're sort of coming to a close now. So, um, oh, one can, more, can... Andrew Homer. Am I right in thinking the Buildwest system resulted in maintenance work 
being paid in beer? Uh, quite often you had uh, uh, some payments in uh, uh, in beer, but quite often, uh, more often, uh, there was the um, concessionary coal that was given, which I hadn't, didn't go into, um, but which was always a bone of contention because the mine owners uh, were trying to stop the allocation uh, all through that period of concessionary uh, coal particularly when you were injured as a miner, yeah. that you couldn't have uh, a, a certain amount of concessionary coal. But one final point, uh, I'll make a plug. If uh, um, anyone wants to find out more of the struggle uh, and the, uh, the hundreds of stories, um, you can get the book on the struggle for justice if you go to... Uh, the Black Country Society shop uh, where it's on sale. I thought you were being very restrained in not saying that earlier, Keith. So, uh, Ward, our chairman, I think, wants to make a comment on preachers. Ward, do you? Are you there? Nope. Okay. Um, Sorry, oh, I was switched off. Yeah. One, just a further comment on on the um, on the local preachers thing in Methodism. Um, many churches, and they certainly had them in the Black Country, um, on a Sunday morning, quite often something like seven thirty in the morning, would hold what they called adult male Sunday schools, and and it was specifically intended to help these guys who had a limited education to promote and develop their abilities to 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 take roles in society uh, and that then <coughs> the uh, the fact that they could train as preachers as well and and the role of methodist preachers in 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 the uh, the, the wider uh, movement of uh, 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 unions generally uh, it's a fascinating subject in itself thank you thank you ward um I think we'll draw to a close then. It's my responsibility, I guess, to say a big thank you to Keith. Thank you from all of us for your, your talk. Um, next time round after Christmas, we have uh, Jeff. I can't remember Jeff's name, but he's going to talk about 200 years of boat building. Jeff Stevens, I think. Um, um, and that will be uh, on the third Monday. So we'll be back, back to normal on Mondays. Um, more details of that will go round.